Hi, and welcome to Homo Ludens, the channel on history and board games. In today's video, I would like to address a situation that uh, most of us are in right now, confinement. In the past few weeks, and in potentially the next few ones, a lot of us are going to be locked at home, uh, meaning that if you don't resort to online wargaming, most of your opponents are going to be your close and loved ones. And here is the situation. Our loved ones think that our games suck. And it's unfortunately an ongoing issue that we've always had is that uh, the close ones that we have usually tolerate the fact that we play war games but try to avoid playing them with us. And the reason is that uh, they think that playing a war game is mostly arguing about rule 12.3.5 uh, about a line of sights uh, in a hexagon uh, on a field when the scenario is uh, October in Russia. Which is not necessarily untrue, a bit of an oversimplification obviously, and uh, this is the problem that we have, is that in that situation, how do you keep up having an ongoing uh, regular habit of wargaming uh, to get your head uh, out of things, and that's uh, something that I wanted to talk about. And to tackle that issue, I want to come up with a strong doctrine uh, on how do you convince the people around you to try, if not uh, war games, at least historical board games. And this video will attempt to do that with providing you with a list of the top 5 games to trick people into playing war games and historical board games. So, the way I structure this uh, top 5 is pretty simple. Uh, it's not by order or preference. Uh, the way I did it is that I thought about the different levels of uh, gamers. And those gamers are linked to archetypes. And I structured them from uh, complete um, non-gamers up to the hardcore Euro gamers. And there are five different levels. And for each of those levels, I picked a game and an approach and explain why I think this game is probably one of the best options that you have to get someone playing a war game or a historical board game uh, and for you to scratch that uh, war game itch uh, without them really realizing that they are playing a war game. And so let's start with the basics. Level zero. So player level zero is your typical non-gamer target. Uh, if you have to picture someone, think about your mom. And when you're thinking about your mom, you're thinking she never plays uh, any war game. Obviously, she doesn't play board game either. That's also obvious uh, most of the time. But don't underestimate the gaming knowledge of a non-gamer at all. If you're thinking about your mom, to <laughs> continue with that analogy, there is at least one thing that she knows and what she knows is cards and that's the thing uh, everybody plays cards everybody is used in most of the culture to play different kinds of card games uh, i know that for example in my family the game of tarot is a pretty popular trick-taking game and everyone in my family plays tarot whatever the age whatever the background everybody plays it and you have to build upon that and i think in that situation the perfect game is battle line Battle Line by GMT is a card game where you are playing uh, different suits of card and you're trying to make combinations and you've got to do it on nine different flags. And the idea here is that with pretty simple uh, mechanics that everybody knows, uh, which is card combination as you would have in poker and different values, you have to take control of different positions. You also have tactical cards that adds also a bit of flavor and there is this tactic feel because you have two ways to win. One of them is by uh, taking control of five out of the nine flags and the other one is to have three consecutive positions that you control on the board. Obviously it's not a war game, it's historical in flavor only, but don't kid yourself, you're not gonna play Path of Glory with your mom. Uh, so you have to start somewhere and I think it's a pretty good uh, way to start. Personally, I've introduced my mom to the game um, one summer and she got obsessed with it and uh, it was actually, she almost disgusted me from the game uh, because we played it so much. But it's a, it's a great game, a lot of replayability, very fast, you can play with anyone. Uh, definitely a strong recommendation for a new player. Now for number four, let's look at another level of player, the light gamer. So here we're talking about people who have a light gaming experience. Uh, think of the people that you know of, might be a friend, uh, might be even your partner, that maybe play Ticket to Ride, maybe play Pandemic. Uh, that's the most uh, classic, modern classic war games. You also have Carcassonne, those kind of things. So they played a few times, they know that gaming is not only Monopoly. 
And that's pretty much uh, only what they know. And you have to build upon that. It's not because they played Pandemic that you can try to force uh, them into uh, playing into a heavier game. Try to manage your expectation, uh, don't be pushy. Uh, and I think you should build upon what they already have, what they already like, and try to make it as non-threatening as possible. And in that situation, I think that the perfect candidate is Pandemic Fall of Rome by Paolo Mori. Why Pandemic Fall of Rome? And that's for multiple reasons. First of all, you have a lot of chances that that person has already played Pandemic. So the core mechanics, they already know. Uh, it's just applied to a different theme. You have some slight variations that are actually super interesting as a wargamer because you have this combat element uh, and you have this feel of content pressure from the Germanic tribes coming to uh, coming to Rome and that's that's exciting as a wargamer, but it's still pretty close to the original material. It's also a collaborative game, making it pretty easy to get into it. You don't have this highly confrontational perspective that you usually link to wargaming, making it way more accessible for newcomers. So definitely a strong option and the thing that I like about uh, Pandemic Fall of Rome is that if by accident that person actually enjoys the experience and express the appetite to try something a bit heavier, you have the perfect follow-up with Time of Crisis by GMT. Time of Crisis is a deck builder game from, I would say, I think it's from two to four player or maybe more, I, I will have to check, but that doesn't matter. It's a, it's a deck building game. It's not cooperative anymore, even though everyone is fighting against the tribes, but it's not a very heavy game and it can be definitely a step up uh, toward other kind of uh, wargaming experiences. Now let's talk about level three, medium gamers. Now we start to enter the realm of something that gets a bit more interesting. We're talking about gamers that uh, have some uh, decent experience with modern uh, board gaming. Uh, they've experienced a different kind of uh, mechanics, they've played deck building, they've played area control, they've played uh, limited uh, player actions, and I think this is where we start to get a bit more options when it comes to gaming. And with a bit of chance there is uh, the possibility that they've already played uh, light tactical fantasy gaming for example. And for those kind of gamers I think that the perfect game is one of the games that I was the most impressed by last year and that's Undaunted Normandy. And Don't in Normandy, uh, for those who follow the channel, is a game that I've mentioned uh, for my uh, After Action report at Essen last year. And I think it's a, it's a brilliant, brilliant design. It's a brilliant design for a lot of different reasons. And if you'd like to know more about the game, there is a channel that did the video way better than any video that I could do on the subject. And that's Shut Up and Sit Down. Their review is awesome and completely spot on. I think that this uh, game is a bit of a gem. It's a tactical World War II game that revolves around a card-driven uh, mechanic and a deck-building system. And what's interesting about it is that you've got a lot of concepts that people are used to and uh, really like in the hobby, which is obviously deck building, something really popular. And if those players already have some experience with games such as the Minion, for example, it would be very easy for them to get into it. What makes this game great for that uh, list is that uh, it also scratched that uh, Wargamer itch. If you look beyond uh, what the game looks like and it looks awesome, you can see a lot of things that you will recognize as a Wargamer. The hexes are hidden but they are functionally there and uh, the fact that you uh, play a card to take an action is very reminiscent from uh, war games that you are used to play. The good thing about this game is that you don't need to uh, use it as a stepping stone towards something else because it's a great game in its own right, but if by chance the person that is playing it and that you're introducing the game to likes it and would like to try something a bit heavier, there is a lot of things that you can uh, do from there. Uh, and I'm thinking notably of a Great War Commander by Hexasim that is taking the combat commander system and applies it to World War One, for example, if the theme is something that they are more interested in. And then again, obviously, combat commander is an obvious option as a next game for those gamers. It's a perfect stepping stone towards something a bit heavier, towards something a bit more interesting, as it introduces them to a lot of the concepts that exist by keeping it very simple, very accessible, and the box is full of super interesting scenarios. And the good thing about this game is that it's a system that is going to expand. Uh, Osprey Game has announced last year that uh, Undaunted North Africa is going to be released later this year uh, and we've seen on BGG some of the new components and it looks very very promising with some vehicles coming uh, into the pack so that's going to be a lot of fun so definitely for those medium gamers to trick them into wargaming Undaunted Normandy perfect option
and now let's talk about the serious board gamers. And here we enter the land of opportunities. It becomes even more interesting. We're talking about gamers that have some significant experience with modern board gaming. Think about those people as the ones that are uh, looking at board game videos on YouTube from time to time, probably have a BGG account. They just never play war games, either because they thought it was boring or never considered it because it was too complex. And there is actually a lot of options for those players. So if you're thinking about those players, there is probably a game that they've heard about because it was a massive hit in uh, 2018. Uh, and that game is Root by Cold Verlu. And I'm not saying that's the game I'm recommending. I'm just saying that they might already know it, either they've played it, or they've seen some video about it and are probably interested by the subject and the asymmetry of it. On the other hand, there is another pop culture reference that they might like and that a lot of people like, which is the series on Netflix, Narcos, about Colombia's uh, drug traffic in the 80s. And I think you have here a perfect option to play on those two pop culture references and you can introduce them to a game that is amazing and that's Andean Abyss by Volko Runke. Why is this game so great uh, and why is it a good option for those gamers? It's because you can uh, get them interested by it by telling them, you know what, those kinds game series that uh, exist are actually one of the main inspiration for Root with asymmetric factions, different objectives, different kind of activities for each of the players and you can tell them that yeah in that game they could play the Cartel of Medellin if they are interested in shipping drugs to uh, North America and make a lot of money. And then Abyss is the first game in the coin series by uh, GMT, a very interesting system and even visually uh, it doesn't look like you're playing a war game. It actually looks a lot like a Euro game. You've got a lot of wooden components, uh, cubes, discs, and you've got trackers all around the board uh, that looks like you're building an engine when you're playing the game. The great thing about this game is that it opens a realm of possibilities after that, because Endian Abyss is only the first game in the series, and the series actually expanded to a lot of different theaters of operation, ranging from the Gallic Revolts uh, and Caesar up to the war in Afghanistan, opening a lot of options for you to explore with them in the future if they actually get an interest in playing those kind of game in the future. And before talking about my number one game for the heavier kind of gamers, I would like to talk a bit about some honorable mentions of game that I didn't select for this top five. Making a top five is always tough because you have to make very limited choice based on a, a wide number of games. And there are a few games that I left aside for specific reason that I'm gonna explain. The first one is another game by Paolo Mori uh, that was also released last year and I've also talked about uh, coming back from Essen and that was Blitzkrieg. Blitzkrieg is a very fun World War II cheat pull game, uh, very fast, easy to learn. The reason I didn't keep it is that I didn't see a lot of opportunities coming out of that game to actually play another war game. It doesn't introduce you to any of the war gaming concepts and you cannot really build upon it. And as a war gamer, you don't feel like you're playing a war game. It doesn't scratch any war game itch, yeah, if I could say. It is a very fun game. I like it a lot as a filler, but it is just this a filler with a historical theme upon it. It's just a great game, but definitely doesn't work in that category of tricking people into playing historical uh, theme or war games. Then for the light gamers, I was also thinking about some block games and I was thinking about two of them. One of them was Sekigara, which is uh, like an interesting twist on the Colombia uh, sort of block war games. And another one was Napoleon 1806 by Chaco's Games. Napoleon 1806 is a great block war game, very easy to get into the system, a very fluid and interesting game, very fast, very fun, a good way to introduce uh, younger ones to uh, war gaming. The reason I didn't pick those games is that when you're playing them, it's very obvious that you're playing a war game. It doesn't have this flavor or uh, this angle that makes the player feel that they are playing something that they already know, just in a different setup and introducing them gradually to something else. And then for the serious gamer, so for uh, the level uh, two of that list, there was another game that I considered uh, next to Andean Abyss, and that was Pax Pamir by Corverle, uh, also the designer of Root. I love this game. I think it's a uh, 
magnificent game for a lot of different reasons. For its mechanics, uh, because of the way it looks, because it's a very engaging and interesting experience, and also because of the point of view that it's taking on the event. It's just that I thought it was a harder sell. It might be highly subjective, but I realized that uh, when I'm talking to people about NDN and Abyss, uh, I feel a lot more asperity, attraction, appetite toward those kind of topics. And when I'm talking about tribal warfare in 19th century Afghanistan, that's a bit of a harder sell. And now let's go into the serious stuff. Number one, poor level, hardcore gamer. Here we're talking about the real heavy gamers. The one who play really big games. They might be playing Twilight Imperium, so they're used to play eight hours on a game or even more. The problem with those kind of players is not the complexity of the game in uh, any case. They actually eat rule books for breakfast, that's not the problem. It's just that those people never considered war games for a wide variety of reasons. Uh, it might be because they never thought about it, because they never were introduced to it, or just because they simply think it's not for them. And I can understand that because I know some of those gamers in my different gaming groups and what I see in them is that they have this interest for the optimal move, for building an engine, for appreciating the complexity and the refinement of uh, mechanics interacting with each other. And the problem with wargaming is that there is two things about it that they hate. One of them is the randomness. And that's something that we love because we know that you can have the perfect plan but you never know exactly how it's going to pan out and that's the friction of war. You cannot predict everything and it has to have a dose of randomness to be an interesting simulation. It cannot be purely deterministic and for them this can be a bit painful. Then there is another thing that we love in our games that they don't like and that's Chrome. And Chrome is all those specificities that are due to the event that the game is depicting. So you have the perfect mechanics and you have the Chrome on top of it that is making them a bit fiddly or altering them in a way or another. And for us it's the flavor and for them it's actually sand in the machine. They look at games like engineers and what they see is something that was almost perfect that got screwed by theme uh, that is not necessarily interesting for the gameplay. It's maybe a bit caricatural, but it's usually two points where I see a bit of tension when I'm trying to introduce uh, war games to those kind of gamers. And here there is a good opportunity with one game that I think is really perfectly in the middle of what we like as war gamers and what they like as heavy euro gamers. And that game is Virsin Das Volk by Histo Games, the company that also made Maria. Virsin Das Volk is actually just behind me and Maria is up there. The thing that is interesting about this game is first its topic. It's like a zoomed in twilight struggle, just looking at Germany from 1949 to uh, 1989, where one player is playing East Germany, the other one is playing West Germany and you're playing for uh, political control but also for your uh, industrial and economical development uh, using cards. The thing that makes it uh, interesting for your gamers is that the randomness is pretty limited. Uh, you do have hand of cards but it's a small hand and most of the cards that you're going to play are laid out on the market which means that you can optimize your moves depending on what are the different actions that are uh, available to different players and that's something that you see that is laid out in front of you and you just have a tiny bit of randomness. So for them they have this feeling that they can build an engine and that they can control randomness uh, at least to a certain extent and the way it looks it definitely looks like a sort of uh, power grid if you would say like a, a, a weird mix between twilight struggle and uh, power grid with a lot of uh, graphical elements and design that makes it look like it the fact that most of the cards or or systems in the game are represented by symbols the colors the way it looks uh, is definitely reminiscent of those kind of uh, german euro games and for the war gamers, what's interesting about it is first of all its topic, but also if you know a bit about the history that of the event that you're playing, when you're looking at those cards that are very abstract, you can actually see behind the card, depending on the event or the person that is being depicted in it, the logic or the abstraction that the designer has intended behind, which makes it a pretty interesting interpretation of the event. The other thing that I like about this game is that if the person liked it, 
you actually have an option to explore a lot of other games uh, in the same category. I wouldn't say necessarily go toward more uh, classical card driven games, but you can definitely start exploring other games such as Twilight Struggle for one, uh, but I think one that could be a perfect next step would be Labyrinth by Volko Renke once again. That also has that feel where you have a bit more control and is very modern in its approach of uh, using cards. And I would say yes, that's my number one for the heaviest gamers. So that's it, you have my four tactics and strategies to uh, convert or at least trick people around you during confinement to play war games or historical uh, themed uh, board games. I hope that uh, it will be useful for you. Let me know in the comment section if you've tried some of those tips, uh, what was the reactions of the player that you introduced to those games, and even if you have your own recommendations. I would be very interested to read more about it. Of course, if you like the video, please like, share and subscribe. And I hope to see you soon. Stay safe.